Thank you to everyone for joining us for the August ECSS Symposium. Every month we highlight two ECSS projects um, among the very many that we have. So we're really happy to have Amit Gupta from TAC and Paul Rodriguez from SDSC uh, talking to us today about some of their projects. So Amit is, um, is, is working on a group that does dynamic traffic assignment simulations. So these really complex simulations among users of transportation systems and the transportation infrastructure itself and how they were able to uh, port a code called Vista to Stampede and what kind of adaptations had to be made for the HPC systems to be able to handle this kind of uh, novel sort of use of those systems. So with that, I will let um, Amit take it away and describe his work. You can um, type questions into chat. Um, and and I can relay them to Amit. I think Amit's probably happy for people to interrupt during the talk. Is that all right to ask yeah. questions? Okay, so, so that's fine too. So you can, yeah, either chat and I'll break in or just break in yourself and I'll just watch the background sound and I may mute folks um, to, to keep that in the background. Uh, so with that, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Amit, and take it away. All right. Um, so Nancy, uh, uh, I won't be keeping an eye on the chat window, so you can just jump in and relay any any questions. Yep, uh, I'll do that. Okay. Uh, so I hope everyone can hear me. So hi everyone. My name is Amit Gupta. I work at uh, TAC, and I'm presenting joint work with my colleague at TAC, uh, Weisha Zhu, and uh, collaborators at the Center for Transportation Research uh, at UT Austin. Um, uh, Natalia Ruiz Juiri, who is the PI on this project, uh, Kenneth Green, and Dennis Bell. So um, our work is basically uh, we've been collaborating to. Uh, uh, so the the topic of dynamic traffic assignment is of uh, great interest to transportation researchers, and uh, uh, it's a very uh, compute intensive uh, uh, simulation. And uh, we've been looking at HPC infrastructure attack to help them scale it up and improve their analysis uh, times. So um, uh, what it basically does is it models uh, interactions that happens between travelers and road infrastructure and between uh, travelers themselves. And uh, all of this sort of analysis is usually uh, on a citywide scale. It's usually simulation based. And uh, shortest path uh, computations are usually from the key uh, component uh, within these uh, frameworks. Uh, it is probably the more uh, compute intensive part of the process. And uh, this is not uh, 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 the trivial case of shortest path in a graph that we typically study. Uh, in, in, in this scenario, the graph uh, the edge weights are time dependent because as traffic conditions change on the link, uh, you have uh, different travel times uh, on the link. And uh, so therefore, uh, uh, these, these shortest paths need to be computed again and again. And uh, uh, therefore, therefore, they become the more uh, compute intensive part of uh, doing these simulations. So uh, the first thing uh, we can keep in mind is uh, 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 when we think of shortest paths and graphs, we kind of Kind of think of the generic graphs that we study in computer science. Uh, you might think of a node and directed edges uh, entering and leaving a node in this fashion. But uh, for this problem domain, we need to keep in mind that uh, what we're dealing with is really uh, a node. This is what a node would be like, and it would have uh, roadways entering and leaving. And also, it's uh, there. There are some subtleties uh, specific to road networks. Uh, 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 that we come across. So, for instance, when you have, when you're in, a, if you consider the road network, uh, you would have these sort of, uh, you would have each turn ha presenting a different delay. Um, so, there are turn movement delays when you enter uh, a junction uh, or a destination. Uh, and there could be signaling delays, there could be traffic signals that make a vehicle stop and then uh, before moving forward. Uh, there could be uh, various costs associated with uh, traveling, uh, traveling a specific link, like uh, uh, there could be prohibitions, there could be one-ways, there could be uh, further tolls. Uh, there could be, each of these could be different for different vehicle types, so cars, buses, trucks. Um, 
uh, they could they could all have different uh, restrictions on their movement and all of these are uh, time dependent so uh, it's important to keep in mind that what we're dealing with is what you're seeing on the left and not so much uh, the reduced graph version that we're used to dealing with on the right in computer science so uh, this is what it might look like for uh, downtown Austin uh, region. It's already fairly complex and it has all of the subtleties that we just talked about in the previous slide. And for a city-wide scale for most of the Austin metro area, uh, this is what these graphs, uh, the road networks would look like uh, uh, with the complexities that we just talked about. So uh, running simulations for these large uh, size, for the city size networks uh, can get fairly uh, uh, time consuming. Also a uh, little bit of background on what on dynamic traffic assignment uh, in contrasting with uh, uh, what's called static traffic assignment. So static traffic assignment is a, is a, is a reduced uh, model where uh, links inflow is always equal to the outflow. So, uh, it's uh, it's a simplified model, uh, but it doesn't represent a realistic model of uh, congestion uh, as it happens on road networks. And dynamic traffic assignment, uh, uh, the details are, are are probably out of the scope of this talk, but uh, they uh, they model it differently, where uh, they, uh, they break up a, a link into various cells, and each cell, as it fills up, affects the previous one. Um, so in a sort of a queuing mechanism and uh, uh, that uh, dynamic traffic assignment uh, is uh, uh, much more compute intensive to do for these reasons and uh, but they form a more realistic model of uh, uh, what how traffic behaves uh, with the infrastructure. Uh, a term another another term that we're going to come across is lambda. A land a routing lambda is basically a num, num, the fraction of vehicles that change route in 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 the face of congestion, um, uh, or that opt to or that elect to go to another route in hopes of finding a shorter travel time. Um, uh, this is again a model of driver behavior, and uh, uh, often, often a configuration parameter that you see in these models is uh, routing lambda. Um, and what are they trying to do with these simulations? Uh, they're trying to reach a state that they call equilibrium. And equilibrium is a state that uh, in these simulations, uh, uh, you don't always, you're not guaranteed to find it. But uh, 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 what the state is, is essentially all of the vehicles traveling across the various routes uh, experience the same travel time and any individual uh, route change uh, can't possibly lower the cost. So in a way it's uh, in, a, in, a, in an intuitive uh, description of it is it's, it's a measure of equal distribution of flow across all the network across all origin destination pairs. So um, uh, it's, it's, ob it's, it's obvious it's, it's not you're not guaranteed to, to uh, for any simulation, uh, you're not guaranteed to find the equilibrium condition, but the goal of every simulation experiment is to converge uh, as close to the equilibrium as possible. And uh, uh, how you measure that is uh, it, it's, it, uh, it's called a gap measure. Um, and um, so I won't get into the details, but this is what a gap calculation uh, looks like. It's uh, so uh, the T's are time intervals, the I's are origin destination pairs, and the, the K's are the all possible routes between a specific origin destination pair. So what this uh, is essentially, F is the flow, and T is the time interval. Uh, for, uh, so the flow for every route uh, uh, with the time interval for uh, every route for that specific time interval, and you aggregate all of them, and uh, um, what you're comparing against is the ideal situation where you look at the total flow for a given origin destination pair and the experience travel time uh, for a given origin destination pair. So you're basically, uh, what you're doing uh, with the gap is you're trying to compare to see how close you are to the, to the, to the ideal situation uh, of equilibrium. And typically what happens in the simulation uh, steps is you go through all these steps and you calculate the gap after uh, you simulate a movement of, of traffic for certain time intervals. And then you measure whether the gap is below a certain tolerance level. 
uh, and at that point you consider your model has converged and then you can look at uh, what what sort of routes were formed and uh, how the uh, how the traffic what the traffic congestion patterns were so the basic DTA workflow is um, you start and you start with an empty network. There's, there's no traffic anywhere, and you and you calculate the free flow, uh, shortest path uh, times, and then you let you sort of set traffic loose onto uh, based on uh, what are called demand tables. Basically, demand tables are uh, 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 where the traffic wants to go. So, who, how many, how many cars want to go between origin A and uh, destination B? Uh, and uh, so uh, you start off with uh, just uh, with empty uh, uh, traffic with empty travel times, and then you sort of set traffic loose based on those times. And it, all traffic behaves uh, uh, by choosing the shortest path available. And when a bunch of traffic converges on a link, uh, the travel time on that link has changed, and that uh, changes the travel time for the next iteration. And, uh, and the and the costs change so forth. So, um, so you uh, so these are the basic stages that you go through when you uh, uh, step through a DTA model. Um, so you find the shortest paths, and then you, based on the configured lambda parameter, you decide how many uh, uh, vehicles are going to change uh, to a, are going to look for a shorter path and, and change their present route. And based on that, you run a simulation of uh, for a certain time window. Uh, after the after the after the simulation has been run, uh, you calculate the gap. Uh, you measure whether it's within the tolerance, and if not, you repeat the following the previous steps. And so that's that's what one iteration would look like. So when we got uh, so Vista, we, uh, uh, the the our collaborators are using uh, the Trans DTA framework uh, called Vista, and uh, uh, the weird thing in the transportation community, so I'm not a transportation researcher, but uh, what I found was uh, um, there is no one unified uh, DTA framework uh, that the entire community agrees upon. So um, every, uh, every research uh, group uh, tends to use their own framework. Uh, the ones our collaborators use is Vista, and it's, uh, it's uh, fairly well documented and, and, and used in research. Uh, uh, for the last 15 years or so. Uh, however, it's, it's very complicated because it's uh, essentially uh, work contributed by many, many generations of graduate students who had a different modeling, uh, added different models to it. And it's a fairly convoluted uh, uh, C++ code, but uh, the specificities of the of, of this type of simulation is uh, complex enough that they tend not to abandon the frameworks that they've been that they've been using over the years. Um, so uh, while it's it's uh, fairly normal for computer science people to, to look at this and say that oh this could be written much better from scratch, but uh, uh, it, it's not always practical. The uh, transportation community who's invested uh, 10 to 15 years in developing a framework uh, is not going to sort of uh, abandon it and uh, there's a lot of uh, code reuse that uh, they would like to happen from an already mature uh, code base so when we first uh, we first wanted to see what the bottlenecks are of uh, their uh, simulation times were in in the order of days uh, for very large networks and uh, so their analysis, you can imagine any, for every, every experiment they would, uh, every, every idea they would want to try out in terms of traffic engineering, they would have to run an experiment, wait for days, look at the results. And so their analysis uh, workflow was extremely slow. So we first profiled uh, Vista to see where it was spending the most time. And uh, we got a, we got a, sim, we got a, we used S-Trace, we used a bunch of other tools like IOSTAT and we got, I just uh, pulled up one of my old uh, uh, S trace logs that was there, and we could see that it was spending almost uh, uh, sixty percent. Uh, in some cases, even higher, eighty percent times in just reads, and uh, uh, in blocking reads actually. So, um, what we uh, 
eventually found was uh, up to 70% uh, time was being spent in basically route file activity. So if we go back and we look at uh, this first stage where it finds new routes, it stores those in, 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 in a file. Uh, it stores some of those in memory, but eventually they all get pushed down to a file. And uh, 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 the, the, uh, the part of Vista that is uh, doing the maintenance of uh, uh, keeping new routes on file uh, was basically what was uh, slowing their process down uh, by a huge amount. And so as a first step, what we did was we moved all of that I.O. into a local RAM disk. So therefore, all the I.O. ops would be in memory. Um, and then uh, they were doing some, some naive things with, um, uh, uh, you know, a lot of things were single threaded. So we could we, we provided multi-threaded uh, scalability, single node multi-threaded uh, scalability with B threads uh, as, we, as, a, as and where we saw fit. And uh, then we, uh, once we removed the IO bottleneck, what was left was a uh, computational bottleneck. And we did this by profiling the code further, um, uh, inserting our own, uh, 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 inserting our own timing uh, uh, functions and so forth. Uh, and we figured out that the, the shortest path computations were, was what was most uh, time consuming. Uh, and if we took the per iteration breakdown, um, you can uh, see in this graph here that uh, the green line is basically how long it took. Uh, the, the red line is the total runtime and breaking it down to the, the shortest path calculation, so TDSP, that's what, uh, that's what it is. Um, that's what took almost 90% of, of the runtime. And within that, uh, we see there are two functions that uh, it, it basically is uh, the way it's architected is it's two parts. It's a label updating algorithm. So it, it starts at an origin and goes and updates the various labels across the whole graph. And then based on the label values, it actually just searches for new paths, new short, shortest paths. So it was the, even within the TDSP algorithm, it was the, the updating of labels that was the most time consuming. And we'll see what that is in the, in the upcoming slide. So, um, uh, so uh, time-dependent shortest path uh, is basically what they have implemented there is, a, is what's called a label correcting algorithm. And uh, uh, so I've already described these that uh, it, it, the first pass is actually you start at, the, start at a destination. And I think I have a figure for it. Okay, so this is what it looks like. So, you start at a destination, and then you have this this graph structure uh, throughout. So uh, you start at the destination and work backwards to the origin. So uh, what a label looks like at, at a node is uh, basically something like this, uh, and it's 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 essentially a vector of uh, a vector of times, um, and. Uh, what it represents is what a label at a specific node represents is the amount of time it takes to reach uh, uh, the destination from from that particular node. So it's the cost of traversing. Uh, the cost of this traversal uh, would be represented uh, uh, in the labels of this node, and each label represents a different time window. So the cost of traversing this link at time t3 would be this third label. And so um, every node would have this such a vector of labels and what the update labels, uh, label updating algorithm would do is it start with, uh, start at the destination with the cost of zero. So it costs nothing to get to the destination from itself. And then you traverse these links one by one um, you set all the other labels as infinity, uh, and then you traverse these links one by one and you update the label costs. And uh, um, so in, it's almost like a reverse, uh, uh, reverse in the sense you're traveling from destination to origin, uh, and uh, it's almost like a reverse Dijkstra's algorithm that you, we're all familiar with on, on, sh on shortest paths. So, uh, so you just traverse back and back and keep updating the label costs. 
uh, and until you've reached the origin and, and, and cover all possible routes between the origin and destination. So uh, these algorithms are run specific to a destination is the one thing to remember. And uh, they run, each label is updated for a vector of uh, times. And uh, uh, for precision of these models, so uh, the granularity of, uh, so the, the size of these vectors, the granularity of time that you're representing, if you want a more accurate model, this is of course a discrete model. So if you want, if you want, to, if you want an accurate representation of reality, you need a large number of time steps. But the, the larger number of time steps uh, uh, causes a, a more comp computational overhead. So uh, there is a trade-off uh, that transportation researchers have to make uh, when configuring these time steps. And so I think they classify it as a, a microscopic simulation is basically with a large number of time steps and uh, 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 and uh, uh, what they uh, what they uh, call these simulations they run Vista is called a mesoscopic simulation, which is basically an intermediate number of time steps. So it's a it's a uh, it's a trade off that they are happy with. Um, uh, in terms of uh, representation of reality. Uh, basically, the, what these time vectors, uh, the order of uh, time that is represented in these vectors is roughly uh, 15 minutes or so. So um, you might have 15, 15 step, uh, vector of size 15, uh, oh, sorry, a vector of size 60 representing about 15 minutes. And uh, the simulation activity keeps, uh, changes the travel time, so the label values keep changing. And due to that, the shortest paths uh, constantly change. And uh, uh, the, uh, the act of uh, uh, the mechanism of maintenance of these uh, routes in the route file uh, amount to uh, small random reads in terms of the IO subsystem. And therefore, uh, uh, that explains more of the IO overhead that we were seeing in the previous, uh, in the previous slides. So what we re-architected uh, uh, this Vista to do use a combination of MPI and uh, P threads. And uh, so remember the shortest parts are calculated per destination. So what we begin with is uh, we, have a t we have a list of destinations that we want to calculate shortest parts for. And we uh, each of them can be done independently. So we distribute them across uh, N number of M uh, MPI processes. This this can go as far as your infrastructure will allow, and uh, within each MPI process, we can just further distribute uh, 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 the destinations uh, on a per process basis, and we can uh, distribute it out amongst th threads of that process. So one thread per core, um, and uh, um, this gives us the maximum use of uh, uh, of uh, the infrastructure. Uh, in terms of uh, concurrently computing as many shortest paths uh, uh, per destination as we can. And the, what happens at the end of all of this is uh, we need to accumulate the results. Uh, and these are accumulated again. Um, uh, these, were, these were done in the, in the parallel file system earlier, but so what we, we accumulated in the nodes and then we push it out. It's one single push from, uh, the master MPI process to a file, and then it begins the next iteration again. So uh, the opti the so that was one of the those are the uh, basic optimizations we had made there, uh, just to get it to scale. Uh, then we uh, we still saw that it was consuming a lot of time and. Um, uh, what we came up what we we examined the the update labels algorithm because that was the bulk of the time consumption and most uh, label updating algorithms or even if you think about a, Di a dijkstra's algorithm they have a scan eligible list uh, in terms of as you as you uh, wade through a net, as you wade through uh, the network structure you uh, sort of queue away uh, or put uh, nodes away in the list to be examined later um, uh, as you traverse the the link structure, and what Vista what Vista used was a DQ scheme, and it visit and the previously visited nodes were inserted on the front on the head of the queue, 
Um, it didn't have any prioritization otherwise. And uh, what we noticed is that it has the, it would cause the sort of feedback effect within um, uh, within uh, uh, within the DQ. So what would happen is if uh, if you would traverse a, the order in which you would traverse the links, you it would be it, it may be possible depending on the network topology that you would add the same node multiple times because you had discovered it from different links and because there was no prioritization. Um, you may end up uh, running the update labels step on uh, on that particular node multiple times, and uh, due to that, uh, we would see uh, a lot of redundant computation being repeated on on each node. So uh, this is what uh, distribution of uh, travel of the update labels uh, of the time spent in the update labels function would look like for a given destination ID. So the X axis is destination ID and the update labels time is on the, on the Y axis. And over multiple iterations, that's why you may see multiple dots per destination ID, but these are the distributions of the times. So there some destination IDs that um, had very high times, as you can see uh, uh, on, the on the top of the graph there. And uh, the, the key uh, change we made here, algorithmic change, it wasn't much change in terms of the code, but what we did was we used, uh, uh, we introduced uh, some form of prioritization into the, into the update labels uh, routine. So what we would, uh, so every node would have to have be prioritized in some, somehow. So uh, we replaced the DQ with a priority queue. And we use this first label value, so the uh, value at t t equals zero, uh, as the as the priority of that particular node. And uh, due to due to there being some priority, it's always the lowest cost nodes that are being picked up first. Lowest cost at t equals zero. So um, uh, the way it traverses the graph is it, 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 it's biased towards the lowest cost paths and therefore um, uh, uh, if when a node is likely to be discovered, when a node is discovered, it's likely to be discovered via the shortest path into it. And uh, therefore uh, uh, when it's discovered via the other uh, paths, uh, the label values are not, the label values are not uh, uh, lower than uh, the, uh, uh, then it's then already uh, available, so uh, it 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 would not run the update label step for uh, uh, when discovered from the other parts, and therefore this reduces some of the update the the operation count for uh, update labels per node, and uh, we're not reducing the lower bounds of uh, this operation, but uh, we're introduce, we're reducing the number of times that it's done per node. And so that improves the average uh, time for this particular routine. And uh, the intuition behind choosing uh, that particular uh, label t equals zero is uh, often uh, this type of, these type of studies are done during uh, a specific uh, period of uh, a specific time window for traffic. So, uh, so something like rush hours, uh, like morning rush hours or evening rush hours. The uh, label values in during such periods are fairly monotonic. So uh, a congested link tends to stay congested uh, during such a period. And that's why uh, this particular approximation works. And uh, so this is the change we observed with the priority queue. So you see the same, the, pre the blue dots of the previous, uh, uh, the kind of simulations that would, uh, the kind of uh, update labels that was being done with the, with the DQ. And the, using the priority queue reduces the times, uh, the number of uh, updates um, that are done, and therefore uh, we get a much uh, uh, much lower average case. So we, we improve the average case time of this routine. <coughs> and uh, so this is another uh, thing we just in terms of the the operation count. The number of times a routine each dot is a destination ID, and the num so the x-axis is the number of times um, uh, uh, update labels was called, uh, and uh, uh, the y-axis is the, the the time that it took. And uh, we can see again with the priority queue, we've drastically 
uh, reduce the, num the, the, the count and therefore we've reduced the time. Amit, are you um, cl close to wrapping up? Or just yeah, sure. I can, I can I can speed it up now. Yeah, no, thanks. Okay. Over. Terrific. Okay. Uh, so uh, just a quick look. These are the data sets that we looked at. And uh, 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 essentially what the only takeaway there is we tried various network sizes. And uh, from small networks to just a, uh, a specific small region, downtown region of Austin, to a large, uh, uh, the entire metro area. And uh, uh, these are the difference in results with the priority queue and the TQ. And uh, the y-axis is the logarithmic scale. So therefore, the larger the network, the more the improvement of uh, uh, using the scheme. Uh, and again, a factor improvement, uh, we get up to, depending on the network and the number of cores we use, we get uh, up to eight to 10 times uh, improve, a factor of improvement in the run times of uh, uh, the DPA algorithms. Uh, so therefore the large uh, performance gains uh, by relatively minor code operations, code modifications that we made. Uh, the, we did attempt some other things uh, like using accelerators like the Xeon 5 on Stampede. Uh, we try to offload calculations at every hop, uh, but we found that uh, such a, such offload is actually it, it costs more to, to get the data to the mic and uh, to the Xeon Phi, do the calculation there, bring it back. So uh, there's a there's a there's a time wasted in sending data back and forth, and uh, we found for that specific uh, uh, offload model, we uh, we found the overhead was too high. Uh, it is possible to. Uh, theoretically possible to produce a graph reduction of the whole problem and offload the entire thing to the mic, but uh, that would just require a drastic rewrite. Uh, also, future architectures are moving away from the offload model, so we abandoned that particular line of investigation. Um, and uh, we tried different labels for a prior for different priority, but the results were similar. And also, uh, there's no generic way that will work for all demand, all tra all types of traffic demand. So. Uh, we halted that investigation as well. Uh, uh, the other, there were other things that we tried. The other things of the workflow that uh, did uh, that we are currently investigating as well. Um, they don't basically the uh, the base the main takeaway in this slide is uh, they need to explore different lambda values to uh, choose which model they will converge on. And uh, the code structure is a very deep. A tree-like hierarchy, so many many classes referencing each other. It's very complicated, uh, and they don't uh, lend themselves well to serialization. So a simple solution using NPI scatter gather is not possible, and so we are investigating uh, how we would serialize those parts of the code. Um, there is uh, uh, some future work that we've planned is uh, 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 in collaboration with the CTR folks is. Uh, uh, a web portal. They would have a web portal on their end to kick off uh, analysis jobs on on, on tax infrastructure, and uh, also we would uh, examine uh, using uh, the the next generation of of the Xeon Five, the Knights Landing, on uh, uh, on seeing how uh, certain parts of this could be sped up and certain parts would be actually slowed down, and and we would examine the trade offs there. Uh, we're also planning to look at uh, how to how to leverage uh, the Hadoop uh, and Spark infrastructure because they have some graph engines within them um, to uh, uh, produce a more scalable solution for our collaborators. Uh, so, uh, just a word on the uh, on the on the funding. Uh, uh, the previous uh, the, this work was initiated on previous funding that was from the Texas Department of Transportation and uh, Campo. However, it was continued on exceed uh, ECSS uh, funding at our end, and of course NSF's funding for the Stampede supercomputer. So, and all the future work would be, um, uh, or all the present and near future work is going to be continued on the through ECSS support. So, ECSS has been really critical into in helping us in 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 uh, uh, having us help these users. And so uh, with that, I'll, I'll take any questions and I'm sorry to go over, over time. Oh, that's okay. Thanks, Amit, for a very interesting talk. If, why don't we, while we're doing questions, why don't you stop sharing? And uh, Paul, if you could start sharing, it's a, um, a, a button towards the bottom of your screen. Okay. Go from there. Um, so first questions from, uh, from folks on the call. I think I muted pretty much everyone during the call, so you might have to unmute. 
let me know if you can't. Well, I guess you can't let me know if you can't do that. You can chat. So should I unmute? Should I mute? Uh, no, because you're going to answer oh. questions for a minute. Yes. But then after yes. that, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, uh, so, so questions from, from, from folks on the, on the call. I know I've got a, I've got a few. I wonder, um, I don't know what, what your background coming into this Amit was, but this is, it's very much different than the type of differential equation sort of calculations that we're usually doing on HPC. I wonder what the ramp up was like for you as an EC assessor kind of diving into what I'm assuming is a new field for you. Uh, yeah, certainly it was a new field. Uh, like I said, we, I had begun this project on, uh, this was my first project here at TAC, so I had begun this project on, uh, um, uh, it was begun on the, on the previous grant before this project was introduced into ECSS. So I, I did have some time to, to try and learn this area. I by no means claim that I have completely learned the area. It is, I, I'm completely new to transportation engineering. My background was actually, uh, distributed systems and operating systems. So completely computer science background, uh, computer science and double E background. And uh, so I had no knowledge of transportation uh, simulations and I'm still learning as I go along. Yeah, great, thank you for that. Um, I think any, any questions from the group and then I probably should better get going and introduce Paul here. One more opportunity for a question. All right, on the symposium website is also the contact information for both speakers. So if you think of something later or want to ask Amit something privately, you can figure out how to contact him there. Um, our second talk is from Paul Rodriguez at SDSC. This is going to be a radically different turn. Uh, this is image mm -hmm. analysis of um, largely black and white photos looking for feature extraction so that digital humanities scholars can use this information to pull out particular features of collections of, um, of photographs. One of these two projects uh, won the best paper competition in the accelerating discovery track at Exceed um, 16 last month. So with that, I will let Paul take it away here. Okay. Can everyone hear me? Can you guys hear me okay? Am I? Yeah, that sounds great, and we can see your slides as well. Okay, all right. So now, the line the line you said now for something completely different reminds me of that old Monty Python uh, show. Okay. Uh, so I, as as Nancy mentioned, there's two image analysis projects that I've been involved with. Um, Alan Craig kind of helped get these things going, and they were both uh, uh, they had both uh, the PIs had applied to ECSS around the same time, and so these are both supported by ECSS and the NIPS. Uh, and the one on the left is called Decomposing Bodies. It's a bunch of images from turn of the century prison identification cards. Uh, the one on the right is uh, uh, photographs from the Farm Security Administration and uh, a couple other administrations that were done during the Depression era. And they're all about you know, identifying or, or documenting uh, Depression era uh, culture at the time. Uh, and so both these projects have this feel that they are digitizing things, but we're interested in something else. Uh, what that something else is, is not always obvious. Uh, and so part of what we're doing is working with the PIs to help flush things out. In some sense, they're exploratory. In some sense, there's some precedent. There's other people who have done things that we say, hey, let's do something like that. Um, in some sense, in some cases, it's kind of obvious. You might want to look at, you know, grayscale images, for example, um, or grayscale uh, mean values, for example. Uh, but, you know, there's, there's a certain, uh, you know, open-endedness to what you can do with these things. So first, I'm going to talk about the uh, image analysis of the rural photography, the Depression era photos. And so this is what uh, we talked about at the Exceed conference. And the people here that you see on the bottom um, are all the ones involved, and uh, Marcus uh, Slavinas um, and Sandeep are from NCSA, and Sandeep and I are, and Alan are also involved in the other project. Um, so there's a lot of overlap in, 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 in people. Um, and so the basic idea for this project, uh, of course, is there, there's a bunch of photographs, so you want to you know, provide some infrastructure to make it searchable, you want to uh, uh, run feature extractors, and then present this in some way to the user, have it sort of accessible so that they can, you know, do something like data mining. In some sense, uh, it really it is like a data mining project, but, but there's more to it. Um, so what we mean by feature extractors, 
there's, we can think about this in terms of visual content. There's faces, eyes, profiles, and the open uh, computer vision uh, package has some built-in models to do some of these things. So face detection has been around for a while now. It's very good. Um, object detection, there's one f somewhere for object detection, but you know, we don't necessarily have, but those, those things require lots and lots of data to train. Uh, we haven't tried that one yet. There's one for body detection that we are probably going to try to, uh, we ha I have checked it out and it works okay, but not great. So we're going to, we're at the stage where we've done uh, a big set of 25,000 images. We've run feature extractions, all the feature extractions here, and, and we're going to try to get um, uh, the images with uh, higher resolution and see if we can improve some of the other extractions. So there's visual content. There's visual characteristics. A lot of these photos, or I shouldn't say a lot, some number of photos, uh, a notable number of photos have holes punched in them. So when they first did the, uh, uh, they first uh, gathered these photos, a person who was in charge of the administration would notoriously go and decide which pictures he, he, he wanted to uh, get rid of and he would just punch a hole in there. Um, there's also a lot of metadata with these photos. So sometime, so when these photographers would take the pictures, uh, they would submit them, they would add a title to them, and then later someone came and added some other information about uh, cate uh, subject categories. And so not all the photos have uh, full titles. Some of them have very short titles. Uh, not all the photos have a subject identification. Not all the photos have a location. So, so some of them just say United States, and some of them actually have the uh, United States, the city, the state, and maybe even the county. Okay, and the other feature extraction that I'm going to talk more about is the title content. So we do have titles, and some of them are full sentences. Some of them are just very, like I said, just short phrases. Uh, but we can see what we can extract from the, from the title to see if there's uh, interesting content. Okay, so here's an example. Uh, so this was a picture by Dorothy Lang. It has a title. Uh, the OpenCV does safe detection. I'm not going to, I'm not uh, uh, going to talk too much about these details. Uh, but essentially, they're applying a filter. You apply this filter at different scales, and you can come up with where you think the face is. And so this is, a, this is an example of a feature detector that uh, already exists. We don't have to do too much. We just have to kind of figure out how to apply it. And this was uh, uh, Marcus and Sandeep have been setting these up for, uh, for, the, for the system. There's also another kind of feature detector, histogram of gradients, which a lot of people use in computer vision. If you look at this screen from a distance, I don't know if you see my cursor, but over here in the middle of those gradients, you can sort of make where the outline of the person's body and head is. Um, but this is just an example of another kind of feature detector. So there's all kinds of feature detectors. And I just want to mention that quickly before I jump into this kind of feature detector. So, so here's an image, and this is very typical. You get an image and you get a title, and the title is, is not really the saying what's in the image in some sense. It's really something more abstract. So here it says, new type of two-story dwelling under construction, Jersey Homestead, Highstown, uh, Highstown New Jersey. Uh, so if you wanted to make a, a, a label, a picture more uh, explicitly, you might say, this is a building, this is a building under construction. You might call, there's grass in the front, there's you know, sky and trees behind it. So you don't get those kinds of depictions. Um, so in some sense, it's really different than some of the things you might see in some computer science stuff. Uh, you know, when Google runs a million images to identify dogs and cats, uh, you know, they're, they have sets that, that are somehow, um, uh, you know, a lot, of those, a lot of those data sets you see are, are either labeled or they're, they, you know, they have very specific kinds of descriptions. Okay, so for example, so for analyzing this, this title, uh, I developed a Python a script that's basically a pipeline and I can run that I run in batch uh, to extract the lexical semantic features and those are the named entities part of speech information and semantic category and so this is actually the 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 process that takes the longest compared to the other feature detectors so face detection and histogram of gradients uh, those actually run pretty fast you know maybe a couple hours for you know thousands tens of thousands ten thousand images uh, but this one actually I'm running, it takes about five hours for about 5,000 titles on one comet node. And a lot of that is actually the parsing and the part of speech tagging and the semantic category uh, lookup. So let me go into a little bit more what those are. So again, these are tools that are out there, 
And I'm just kind of gathering, assembling these tools and trying to figure out the right way to apply it. Uh, for these kinds of examples, a lot of entities might have some word like Mr. Smith. It's a named entity. You want to kind of clean that up because that might uh, uh, actually be interpreted as a city if there's something called Smith's Town or something. Uh, so I find the best way to run these things is to go ahead and get, get the named entities, get the city and states, get that, uh, remove that. And then I do the parsing. I get the part of speech. And then I, I use the WordNet ontology to search for what possible meanings a noun can have. So now we're not doing word sense disambiguation. That would be way beyond what we have time for, or what even, you know, that would be real beyond cutting edge, perhaps. Um, but because we're dealing with a kind of constrained situation where if there's going to be a title or there's going to use a noun, and that noun has a possible physical interpretation, there's a good chance that that's actually what the sense of the word is. Okay, so that's what we're going to – so – so I'm using this WordNet semantic ontology. WordNet is a package that's been out there for many years. It was developed in Princeton by a bunch of linguists, and they you know, have an API. It's now available through the uh, Natural Language Toolkit in Python. Um, you can go to the website and actually type in words and see what it looks like. So for example, on the, on the right of the screen, uh, if you go to the website, you can type in the word type, and type has different kinds of uh, semantic interpretation. So as a noun, there's what, like six, seven different senses, whether, the, you know, and what counts as a sense is, of course, the, what linguistics are you about? Uh, okay, so you want to look at, so what I do is I set up a, a, a pipeline to look at the first two sim, uh, sin, uh, sin, uh, synonym, synonym senses, senses. So for the word type, it's involved in several different uh, cinnamon sets. And I'm looking at the first two because those are usually the most frequent and the most uh, highly used. And then I look at the word and um, uh, the stem of the word. So I'm also, you also have to, when you use the WordNet, you have to look at what's called lemmas or they call it, um, oh, I can't remember what they call it. Uh, but sometimes you might the word pop and that has a certain interpretation uh, that you might think is the same as dad although that's a low frequency interpretation. And so if you have the word dad, you want to include dad and daddy as you know, possible uh, instances of the word dad. And, and so this comes out because I want to track the frequency of word usage. So the free, having the frequency and having the top two uh, semantic senses will help me uh, avoid false positives. And then I look at the WordNet ontology, and I look at the levels or the, or the hierarchy of this ontology, and I look for these particular categories. So these are the main categories I'm looking for that I think have some possible uh, instantiation in the, in the picture. And not only that, but our PI had, had mentioned that she's interested in certain kinds of questions like, gee, can we, can we you know, figure out when a picture has an animal? Um, okay. So this is what it looks like for the sentence uh, that we were looking at. New type of two-story dwelling construction. Uh, the word type, it does, have, uh, it does have interpretation as a noun, where it could refer to as person. But when you go look at how often this is used compared to the other uh, uh, words in that semantic, uh, in that synonym set, it's a, it's a low usage. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. And I also have on the far right, <coughs> Uh, the level that you get in the parse tree. So I'm not going to say too much about that, but when you do a parse tree, um, you know, knowing where level, if uh, a, a noun can be in the parse tree, might give you some uh, information about whether that's likely to be depicted. So you might think that head nouns that are higher in the, in the parse tree are more likely to be the focus of a, photo of a photograph. So that's the kind of thing, though, that... Um, Right now, I'm gathering that information, and at some point in the future, it'd be interesting to see if that does correspond, in fact, to uh, the focus of uh, photographs. So, so, head, so in linguistics, there's something called topic and focus of a sentence, and we can see if that actually correlates some, to some degree with um, focus of a picture. But that's kind of, that's a little bit, um, again, exploratory. I'm keeping that information because it's there. The word dwelling, uh, that's a noun, it's a housing, uh, its uh, semantic category is housing. Uh, housing is lower on the level of structure. So I have both the information about the, the hierarchy there, and um, that has a higher frequency sense. So 
So that's probably more likely to be an accurate, uh, uh, an accurate identification of the semantic sense. Okay. So going through this title, we can at least clean up the words. We can do word clouds. So I just wanted to do a shout out of this uh, uh, for the Text Analytics Gateway. Um, so they they have a gateway that I can upload some text and get nice little word clouds. But I can also ask queries now. I can also query the data now, like this. Select all images where there's a word that might mean animal. So I ran this out of a set of like uh, 5,000 images. About 275 had some mention of an animal. Uh, I could look up the subject categories to see what are the subjects where they mention animal. Uh, and then I can, I can go through and pull out false positives. So the word young has an interpretation as an animal. It, it's often used when you say, in some of these pictures that were, that were put into this uh, query or that came out of this query, the title was something like a young girl. And the word young, in that case, it has a possible interpretation as a noun, but uh, in that case, it should be, it should have been tagged as an adjective. And so I can go back and look at the speech, part of speech tags uh, in the sentence, part of the speech tags, when you parse it and see if I'm, or and the frequency of the use to see if I should extract certain words that uh, or should not include certain words in this query. Okay, we can also do queries like this. Select all pictures by Lang with a possible person uh, in the title and the number of faces greater than zero. So, so here's an example where I, I'm getting some data out and I wanna, it's a visual data. Um, and so we could, one way, one way I, I run this on Comet by the way. So I have all the information I loaded into an SQL light database. I can just run queries on this and, and then I can output file names and where those faces are, and I can do things like this. Uh, I can gather up those faces, put red squares, I'm sorry, gather up the images, put red, red squares around the faces. We could download it to the user, give it, let them create slideshows. Um, now, our users are, are, are interested in the kinds of pictures that Lev Manovich does. I don't know if some of you might have heard of him because he's been involved in some of this, uh, some HPC work uh, off and on. Uh, looking at collections of photo photographs. And here's an example where he did a, a collection and he had manually tagged faces and bodies and they might do a, a histogram plot like this and they actually might use thumbnails. Uh, so we could do something like that. This is the kind of thing I think we're going in the direction we're going right, right now is trying to figure out how to present this data so a user can, can uh, interact with it. So this is just a simple thing I did in MATLAB where I took the, uh, took the images from that query where Dorothy Lang um, with a photographer, and I did a histogram where I split out the x-axis by year, and you can zoom in, and you can see these, these pictures uh, that she did in 1939 that show faces. So that's the kind of thing that this project is, is doing. That's the kind of direction it's going. Um, I did talk a lot about uh, the NCSA involvement, which is really gonna be important when we start pulling all this data together and trying to uh, make it available to the user. Um, okay. So let me, let me, I think I still have like five, ten minutes. Uh, let me go to the other project. So the other project de is called Decomposing Bodies. It's also about collecting, analyzing, digitizing data. And I'll show you a short clip of, I hope this comes out on the screen. So this is just a short clip from a digital media project that uh, the PI did with with some of our interim results, uh, and so she's so her core research is all about trying to well to, you know look at the relationship between human notions and of self and the procedures that we use to uh, identify uh, and measure. Uh, okay. So what is this project? This is the prison cards. So turn of the century, uh, before there were computers, people used to uh, take pictures and then write all kinds of uh, um, measurements about the person. Uh, and also the front of the card, you see their faces, their profile, and you see all these measurements about their eye width, their head circumference, and so forth and so on. In the back of the card, uh, it's just some uh, information about the crime, their name, uh, and uh, interesting, there's a field called the set, which I'm gonna talk about more. So, so this one, you know, we're trying to do basically, uh, it's a different kind of image analysis because image analysis, we're trying to, in this case, not extract features, but extract the information itself that is written on the card. 
Um, so on the front side, and this is what Sandeep has uh, been working on, um, it has all these digits uh, that, are that represent the measurements. And so it's a segment. So the idea here is you have to segment the cell, extract digits, and identify it. And this is something that's been done uh, in a lot of different contexts, often called the MNIST. Uh, there's an MNIST uh, data set that's been around for a long time uh, that's been uh, well studied in computer science. And so this is, um, uh, there are certain techniques that are kind of well uh, applied or well understood, uh, but there are differences here because this, this has a decimal point where something like the post office, which is very interested in, has been doing digit identification for a long time, they don't uh, have decimal points like that. Um, okay, the back of the card is, is something more, um, more vague. So this is, uh, we just want, want to see if we could do some OCR in handwritten text. Now, uh, OCR is, is not, you know, it's not, uh, uh, it's not very easily done. Um, there's not, it's not, um, it's not as sort of advanced or mature as, as face detection, but we have some constraints. So it turns out that a lot of these cards were written by one person. And the particular field I want to look at is the, the descent field, which doesn't have too many values. So here I've zoomed in on the card, and unfortunately you can't see it very well, but this says descent, and there's a value. So the field word is descent, the field value. In this case, it's hard to read, but it actually says German and English. Now there's some other fields uh, nearby, which, um, so here's a field called color. And so as it turns out that every year, there, or every other year, there's some updates to the cards. So, you know, we're looking at years from like 1900 to 1910 or something like that. And when the cards switch, sometimes the field position switch, sometimes the field comes and goes, so the color field isn't always there. Uh, sometimes there's ranges of photographs where they're switching back and forth between the two, uh, the two cards. And so that, has, so that adds a certain amount of variation to how are you going to, where are you going to find these particular fields. Um, but the process we're, I'm doing is, uh, for the back side of the card, uh, looks something like this. Um, and and a, lot of these, a lot of these procedures are, are things I just found that people have been doing that seems to work for, for getting to uh, uh, what we're going to try to identify. Um, so these are, these are pictures of the cards that the PI has. You can see the cards themselves are bent uh, because they're very old, um, but we can just use a simple procedure at the threshold to figure out where the card is. And then we can, uh, we can based on the card type, we sort of have an idea where the word descent, where that field is gonna be. So we can take a subregion near the field, binarize it, uh, and this is just using MATLAB functions, rotate it, so sometimes the card's warped a little bit. It helps sometimes to rotate just a few degrees here or there, um, you know, uh, left or right, depending on some criteria, which I'm just looking at how, uh, how many pixels are across, um, across the image. So we can rotate, we can denoise it. So MATLAB has a, uh, some functions. These are, these, a lot of these are kind of functions that you see in the OpenCV package uh, that's been around. So I'm not really inventing anything new at this point. I'm just kind of assembling things. Just like, uh, just like I did with the other project. Okay, now to find the word, to find exactly where the field is, uh, the, there are some OCR tools that don't work very well. And part of that reason is because these fonts are not actually that common. So this font right here, the word descent, um, is a little bit different than probably what it has. So I find that the best way to identify exactly where that word descent is, is just by matching uh, a profile to a template. Uh, and I'm gonna say a little bit more about that. Um, and then I can extract the word, the field value by taking a window next to the word. Okay, so this is what I mean by matching to a template, um, matching a profile to a template. So this is called word spotting. So let's say I, uh, like I, like I said, the word descent doesn't have too many values. In fact, there's, um, in 1901, I just did a small sample. I gathered 51 templates that had 11 nationalities. Most of them, uh, most of these cards have German, Irish, Negro, or English as a descent. And in fact, it's a large majority. So for each, um, so for each image, once I can, if I can extract where I think the field value is, then I can take a profile, which is either a sum of the columns, 
or a sum of the transitions from on pixel to off pixel and vice versa. So I can get two profiles. I can do that for the templates and then I can uh, just do some interpolation to match the template size and I calculate a distance metric. Uh, so in the literature, a lot of people do this. They, they have some success with word spotting when it's one person writing and they're nice, you know, they do, so you can do a good job uh, binarizing and segmenting uh, where the words are. And they often use something called dynamic time warping, but I'm finding that Euclidean distance is much faster. And as long as I can do interpolation so that they're the same, so that my profiles are the same size, interpolation is essentially smoothing things out. But with Euclidean distance, I can get pretty much similar performance to using dynamic time warping. Um, and I'm finding that uh, I'm writing these on bridges. I can, I can um, you know, the extraction, Let's see, this process right here is probably taking the longest. I can run, um, you know, 500 cards, extract cells for the word descent in probably an hour. And this one, this, if I use Euclidean distance, it runs very fast to do the matching. Okay. So let's look at, so here's what I did first to start. So I want to get a sense of how good this can be. I took all the templates I had. And remember, I, I said I had 51 templates, uh, and that's, that's in the x-axis. So I have some number of English. I have more German and enough, a fair number of Irish and more Negro. And then a, a, just a few examples of some of these other nationalities. I use a dissimilarity matrix based on the distance measure for matching that I discussed in the previous slide. And I'm just plotting... Uh, uh, this similar, uh, dissimilarity matrix. So it's essentially a distance matrix. And you can see that, that some of these, you would like to see squares along the diagonal, which would suggest that, uh, that each, each example is most similar to other examples in its same class. Um, and you do get that to some extent for Negro, but Negro also has some similarity to uh, uh, what looks like German. Uh, Irish seems to be different, so the blue here is zero, I should say. I should, I should have said that. Yellow is, uh, so zero is good, that means you're very close, and the blue, um, I'm sorry, yeah, blue is good because that means you're very close, yellow means you're farther. So Irish has some similarity to itself and some, uh, uh, some distance, some dissimilarity to German and English. So let's look at just, just an example of what I'm talking about here. So German, there's two examples of German, and remember these are these are words that I've pulled out that just segmented well, binarized well, it wasn't too noisy, uh, and I'm, pulling, I'm using these as my template examples. And I'm using these, this was from 1901, and later I'm going to show you what happens when I apply it to 1904. Um, but you get a lot, even within 1901, even, even though these are well uh, segmented and well binarized, uh, you do get a lot of variation. So here's an example where it's the same person writing, it's the same capital G, but you know, they start with a very heavy point. Um, whereas this one, it looks like the starting wherever they start, it's not obvious where they start, but at least this, this little uh, turning point is, uh, is much uh, uh, bigger than the turning point over here. The E, sometimes you can see the hole in the E, sometimes you can't. Sometimes you can see the hole in the R, sometimes you can't. Sometimes the word above, German uh, or above this value gets uh, has a has some kind of letter that has a tail. Uh, sometimes there's just noise that doesn't clean up well. So there's all kinds. Sometimes it doesn't quite segment so well. So here the the end got cut off, uh, whereas here the other one, the bottom, the end didn't get cut off. So all these things make for for uh, noise in the process. If I do a hierarchical clustering. Okay, so now I'm taking these templates, and so this is this on the bottom shows, um, you can see, I don't know if you can see, I'm going to zoom in in a second here, but you can see in general the tree uh, doesn't, you know, it has this nice kind of possible uh, clustering where you might think, okay, here, you know, if I cut off the tree at this level, I would have three clusters, cut it off here, you know, maybe four or five clusters, and so there, and there is some variation in the height, and so that's a good tree, you like to see that, but when you zoom in on the particular uh, items, you see that, well, here's three Negro uh, templates that did cluster together, but then Negro templates are also over here. Uh, here's a German 
templates um, here. And so the English template is all split out all over the place. Here's three that did cluster together, but here's some English templates that cluster closer to the German and Negro. So there's quite a bit of variation across these, across these, um, or square variation within a, within a particular value so that the clustering is hard. If I do a, if I apply a leave one out classifier, um, okay, so using a minimum distance of my case that I left out to the set of templates and taking like a one nearest neighbor, um, basically, I can get up to 42 out of 51 uh, correct. So that's actually pretty good, but that's, again, that's kind of, uh, you know, this best case scenario of, of the best template, of the best um, segmentation and binarization examples. If I use a mean distance of the case that's left out to the template, so if I take the mean, if I take one out and I take an average of, you know, this, this test case to all the Germans, for example, if I do that for all the cases, I get about 30 out of, 30, out of 51. So my, my expectation is that the best possible scenario I could get maybe 80% correct. A more likely scenario is that I'm gonna get about 60% of correct if I can get good segmentation binarization. When I take this data and I apply it, oops. Uh, oh, here's, here's, I'm sorry. So that was a, that was, that was a, uh, <laughs> this, is the, this is the one I wanna share. Okay, so um, here's when I take those, so I do a matching, so I take my segmentations from 1904 and I take my values and I try to match the templates from 1901. And this is the kind of performance I get. You can see that, uh, let me zoom in on this in the next row. So here's the first row. So there's about uh, 30 photographs uh, that kind of get grouped together when, when the person, when they were taking photographs, they kind of grouped it by year and they did batches of 30. Um, so I'm getting about 40% correct. So here, for example, Irish matches well. Uh, Slavic, I didn't have many examples of Slavic in my template, it didn't match well. This one is hard to read, it's, I think it's Negro, uh, but you see it got cut off. The second one is very hard to read, I'm not sure if it's German or something else, it could be American. Uh, so here's a case where I have, I think, three out of five cases that are readable to me, one that I'm not sure about and one that I'm completely not sure about. So overall, I'm getting about 40% correct when I see, you know, good, in good sets. So I'm, uh, in some bad sets of 1904, I'm getting less than 40%. Um, but that's where I am right now. I think I can hopefully get up to, you know, 40% is not bad when you think of, when you consider the fact that there's uh, up to 11 nationalities that I'm checking. Um, but we'd like to see if we can get better. Okay. So that was template matching. The other direction I've been going in is looking at the possibility of using a convolution neural network. So I'm not gonna to say too much about the detail of this, but this is now a completely different kinds of feature detection, feature extraction procedure, because I'm not giving it a filter ahead of time. Um, yeah, you so, should probably try to wrap up, Paul, if you can. Okay, give me uh, two minutes. Yeah. Uh, so there's a Python uh, toolkit that I've been using. Um, I extracted some capital letters. And in this case, I was just sampling different uh, capital letters from the county field. So the word Frank, uh, so Franklin is one of the counties where these prisoner uh, cards are from. And so my convolution neural network can do, if I do a sliding window, my convolution neural network uh, actually does, has a moment where it predicts Frank, predicts F pretty well. Um, but the whole issue with convolution neural networks is it needs a lot more data. So I'm, I'm at the point where if I can run my word spotting, I can maybe pull out capital letters uh, from the cases that I think are, are matching well. And then I can use that to build a convolution neural network that I think will help me with the word spotting. And that's it. Okay. <laughs> uh, great. Uh, Thank you very much for, uh, for, for shoehorning uh, two talks into a short uh, I know. Bit of time there. Uh, do we have any questions for Paul from folks who are on the line? Yeah, hi, um, this is Mona. I have a couple of questions. Um, the very first one that you presented, were there a lot of manual um, data entry as well? Like for instance, you know, categories and year, those obviously you probably won't get from the description. Were there manual data um, 
No. So, well, those were entered. So this is a collection from the Library of Congress. And in the, in a lot of these pictures were taken in the 30s and early 40s. And then sometime in the 40s, they actually started uh, organizing these and putting subject categories on them. So in the beginning, they just had a title and a location and, they, and a photographer. And then they started adding things like uh, subject categories. So, so there was some other person later who actually started categorizing these things. And I don't think, I think they only categorized about half of the, uh, the images. So maybe, you know, 80 to 100,000 or something like that, um, that have a subject category. So you're look. let me see, let me see, I can go back to, yeah. Um, does that make sense? Does that yeah. answer to the question? So for the current project, you guys did not do a lot of manual sort of data entry. No, no, we're not doing any manual data entry for this. And no, then for the second one, it sounds really interesting project. And I know the, um, the, the, pic the pictures are very old, but I was wondering if you had any sort of HIPAA issues to deal with since it's got obviously personal identifiable information on those things. Um, no, no, I think, I think these are public domain. I'm not sure if they're public domain. Um, but they're pretty, I mean, they're from, they're over a hundred years old. So I don't know, I don't know if there's HIPAA stuff. I mean, we're not, we have, we're not doing anything public yet anyway. Okay, thank you. This is Bob, let me just chime in real quick. I'm not a HIPAA expert, um, so I, I would confirm this, but I believe that once the, um, once the participants are, are, are deceased, that the data is no longer I'm no longer considered sensitive. And I'm no longer subject to, to HIPAA. Yeah. Okay. But I would confirm. Yeah. <laughs> so I want to um, wrap this up to let everyone get going. Thanks for staying late on this call. Paul, I wonder if you could say anything about what 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 difference HPC has made in terms of kind of processing time or the approach of the digital humanities researchers to this work? So, 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 so let me, uh, yeah, let me just go back to the top because there's a sense in which, you know, HPC is necessary just because there's so many pictures. So, you know, 200,000 pictures and just to try to get a, just to try to do the, you know, the data management piece. Uh, you need something, um, you know, something that can process this. Um, right, so they wouldn't have even been considering analysis, uh, analyzing a collection of that size if they didn't have these sorts of resources. Right, right. Yeah. Now, now, if all you were going to do is take, take the photographs and just, and just, you know, sort them and, and put them in a, in a, and, you know, maybe just have an index for them, that wouldn't be much, but maybe you wouldn't need it. But to do the extractions... And, and then trying to organize that, that's when you, that's when we, that's when we really need it to do, um, you know, some of these, some of these feature extractions, especially that, you know, not only the face, but getting the histogram of gradients, getting the mean scale histogram, I mean, the grayscale histograms. Uh, yeah, those, those you want to, uh, it's very beneficial to use HPC. So, so there's that, but then there's also just the expertise. So the NSA guys have a lot of expertise in, in doing some of this and, um, and making, figuring out ways to make it available uh, for, uh, for an interface, for interactions. Um, and the same goes for the other. So, the first, so for both projects, it's, it's a combination of uh, technical expertise and having access to HPC resources. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank both of our presenters again. A recording of this, if you wanted to share it with other colleagues, will be up on the symposium website probably by the end of today, as well as slides from both of the presenters and contact information. So thanks to those of you on the call for, for sticking it out late, and thanks especially to both our presenters for some really great talks today.